uh, discussion afterwards. Sure. Thanks very much. Um, well, thanks to everyone for coming and thanks to Tony and his colleagues for uh, organising this seminar and uh, congratulations to them for, through this centre, maintaining the independence of critical social theory, which is something that we very badly need in 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 present present circumstances and what I tried to in, engage in in uh, all the books that Tony was kind enough to show you pictures of and the others as well was indeed critical social theory. Perhaps I'd emphasise particularly with uh, historical orientation and particularly um, taking Marxism, the, or rather Marx's critique of political economy, to put it more precisely as its main theoretical reference point. Now, why why did I I write a book called The New Age of Catastrophe? Um, a few months ago, when Cormac McCarthy, the uh, American novelist, died, someone actually another uh, another social scientist tweeted a quotation from one of his uh, last books, The Cities of the Plain. Mostly they just seem to be waiting for things to be a way they'd never be again. Waiting for things to be a way they'd never be again. When I read that, I immediately replied to the tweet, that's up. Uh, people live, have been living in the expectation of a return to normality for something like 15 years. That is people who've had the luxury of living some kind of relatively acceptable normality, which is, uh, excludes, for example, the people of Gaza, who currently undergoing bombardment and displacement in the most terrible way. But people more generally have been living in the expectation of a return to normality after the world overcame the global financial crisis of 2007-9, after the pandemic, after, so people hope, the war in Ukraine, now after this new terrible war in, in Gaza. But we have to recognise, I think, that this normality is not coming back, that we've, we've fallen down the rabbit hole and it's going to be a lot harder to get out of it than it was for, was for Alex. Uh, and I'll try to explain what I mean by by saying this in in what in what follows. Um, as Tony mentioned, um, I a few months ago published with Polity a book called The New Age of Catastrophe. And it may be helpful to explain a bit why I wrote the book. The starting point really was the uh, Extinction Rebellion protest in uh, April 2019, you know, a few months before the pandemic descended upon us all. And those were tremendously inspiring and in invigorating. I mean, here was a movement that in seeking to save the planet and the species who live on it, were able to shut London down for a, for a, for a week in the spring of 2019. Uh, something that you know, speaking as a, as I think Tony said, a long-standing political activist, you know, I spent a lot of my life trying to, you know, disrupt the normal workings of capitalism, particularly in London. But I don't think I and my comrades have ever been able to achieve that. But Extinction Rebellion managed to do that. So I took the inspiration from that moment, but. I also thought about what they were saying. What they were saying was that unless um, they, they were demanding that the 
the government adopt a target of zero emissions, I think by 2025. And if that didn't happen, they warned that the result would be catastrophe. And I thought about that. I thought it was a good target and I supported that campaign. But of course I thought like lots of other people, what what if you know, what if that target isn't met? Which of course alas it it won't be, we know from what's happening at at the minute. Um in other words, what Extinction Rebellion presented themselves was a revolt, a rebellion to prevent catastrophe. And I thought, okay, that's good, but say they fail to prevent catastrophe. Um, does that mean that revolt no longer has a has a person? What about revolt in the midst of catastrophe with the aim of mitigating catastrophe? And uh, um, a kind of sensibility, historical sensibility focused on catastrophe more and more occupied my imagination. Um, of course, the pandemic came quite soon after the, the first explosion of Extinction Rebellion and also the school strikes and so on, so on and so forth. Uh, and the pandemic showed that catastrophe could come in different and quite unexpected forms. And also, I think that this was such a universal experience with um, so many uh, tensions and challenges, apart from, of course, the suffering and death that the virus, the virus caused. It was a, a, a universal experience for the humankind. And it really marked the moment at, at which I, I think humankind's coexistence with catastrophe, humankind's living in the midst of catastrophe became, became evident or undeniable. I'm just reading, I haven't finished it yet, uh, Naomi Klein's very interesting new book, uh, Doppelganger. And a lot of it is about the experience of the pandemic and the sense of having crossed a watershed. Um, that's one of the, the feelings that you get from the book, that the experience of the pandemic crystallized the way in which our societies were, were, were changing. And at the, the height of the lockdown, so I find myself returning to the books of, of Mike Davis, the uh, great American Marxist histor historian who very sadly died about a year, a year ago. One of Mike's main themes was, was cat catastrophe, understood broadly to some extent as sudden, sudden and dramatic change he saw the whole history not just of humankind but of nature as marked as punctuated by by catastrophe but he also looked at the historical experience of particular catastrophes i mean it's most systematically thematized in a great book of essays that he published at the end of the 1990s called the ecology of disaster but um his most in-depth study is late Victorian Holocaust, which is about the way in which the interaction between um, um, sorry, I've just forgotten. This is a sign of age. This is a <laughs> consequence of um, uh, of being a, a retired academic, I remember, the interaction between the El Nino cycle, of a, another twist of which we're going through at the minute with some effect on some role in the very high temperatures we've experienced this year, the interaction between the El Nino cycle bringing drought to large parts of the what we now call the global south in the late 
19th century and the integration of countries like Brazil, India, and China in a, a liberal world economy centered, of course, on the city, the city of London. And it's a, it's a great work. It's, um, it shows that you can look catastrophe in the face and understand it, but still preserve an identification with its victims and their struggles against it. And uh, not long before Mike died, um, uh, a festrist, uh, a book of essays celebrating his, his contribution was published with the title Between Catastrophe and Revolution, which very much sums up Mike's thought. He, he was prepared to stare catastrophe in the face. He was one of the people who predicted uh, the, that um, the way in which uh, capitalism was industrializing nature would lead to pandemics, uh, such as we experienced with uh, COVID-19. Uh, but at the same time, uh, he didn't give up the idea of fighting for and winning a systemic alternative to capitalism. And then, of course, as the, um, as the pandemic relented, somewhat at least, we had and continue to have extraordinary events. The 6th of January 2021, an organized assault by the far right on the US Capitol, that's what we know it, it was now, uh, with uh, the encouragement of the incumbent whom they hope to keep, keep in office. If this, you know, didn't take us, but this didn't take us to the, you know, the ultimate barrier of weir weirdness. Uh, the Prigozhin mutiny in Russia in June this year, something like, you know, Renaissance con conduct cherry rising against their lord and paymaster, and in the end getting the kind of, uh, what shall I say, compensation for their defiance that uh, <laughs> Machiavelli would certainly have recommended. These are things that I, I think not that many people would have imagined could, could happen. And it goes on, of course. Um, and so I thought, I decided, I, I wrote an article responding to some of these developments, but I decided, and I was encouraged by Polity Press, to write a book looking at it more systematically. Now, the central thesis of the book is that we're experiencing uh, a multidimensional crisis of of capitalism, um, that, and the, the particularly important, important dimensions are, first of all, biological. Um, and I'd emphasize this. Um, in the book, I compare the present age of catastrophe with um, what Eric Hobsbawm calls in his book, uh, Age of Extremes, uh, the age of catastrophe, by which he means the period between 1914 and 45, in the 20th century, the World War, the Great Depression, the victories of fascism, and of course the, the, the Stalinist terror and capping it all, the, the Holocaust. Um, and what I argue is that we're living through at least the beginning of a comp comparable period of catastrophe. But although the elements that were causally crucial in that first age of catastrophe are still present, namely the economic and geopolitical, I'll come back to those in a minute. Um, the driving force today is capitalism's increasing destruction of nature expressed, of course, through through climate change. You know, we've been living through um, a, a year of intense heat, wildfires, droughts, etc. When I was an, on holiday 
in Greece on an idyllic island, the island of Ithaki, um, on the uh, in the Ionian Isles, on the edge of the Adriatic. For several days, the sky was obscured because of the wild stars that had started, huge wild stars, um, in the far east of Greece, um, hundreds of mile, miles away, close to the Turkey, Turkish border. And that's just a small inconvenience. Uh, other people suffered a lot more than it. In, inconvenient. But the pandemic, as I've just gestured towards in referring to Mike Davis's work, is another instance of the the way in which the capitalism's uh, destruction of nature is increasingly reacting back on us and creating conditions that put human life as well as that of other species in increasing danger. Um, and I was influenced particularly by the work of the Marxist, Canadian Marxist writer um, Ian Angus, who wrote a very good book on the Anthropocene, which which highlights the famous hockey sticks. Um, in other words, the way in which different kinds of environmental damage all take place, all take off spectacularly, accelerate from the middle of the 20th century onward. And he underlines the fact that this is a historically significant moment. This is around the time of the Second World War, uh, an industrial war waged um, essentially on, on oil and, and petrol. That's what drove that war, that drove literally the tanks, the aircraft carriers and so, so on and so forth and helped to project humankind into the ex acceleration of environmentally destructive trends that we've seen since then, as human beings' intervention in nature becomes increasingly toxic and, and, and destructive. So this, for me, is the most important uh, um, driving force of catastrophe. But there's also... As I mentioned briefly before, the economic element, uh, what uh, Michael Roberts, the Marxist political economist, calls the long depression, the long period of slow growth that capitalism has experienced, particularly Western capitalism, since the 1970s, Roberts argues, to me convincingly, although not always to others, that this reflects a chronically low uh, rate, of, rate of profit, a crisis, that, uh, a period of stagnation that far from ending, uh, now seems to be drawing what had been becoming the dynamo, the new dynamo world economy, namely China, into, into it. Um, and a stagnation which is now accompanied by an acceleration of inflation for the first time time in decades, although I want to say something about the political significance of inflation if I have time uh, later. Then we have, again, like between 1914 and 45, we have um, the geopolitical dimension, the re-emergence of major inter-imperialist rivalry. I mean, this is now... I, this is now undeniable with the with the war between um, but between Russia and Ukraine, with um, the U.S. and its allies in NATO taking advantage of the invasion itself, a completely unacceptable act in order to to both to to weaken Russia and to mobilize, particularly against China because the fundamental imperialist conflict uh, on a global stage is that between the United States and China. China, uh, because of its rapid economic growth, because of its lack of integration in the US-dominated system of uh, alliances, because of its rulers increasing efforts uh, technologically to upgrade the economy, 
there's a lot of discussion about how successful they've been in nurse, but they certainly have that ambition. And it seems to be some success when it particularly comes to the industries and raw materials of the green green tran transition. And when we see the disaster that is in unfolding in Israel-Palestine at the present time, we can see very easily how that could uh, feed into this larger pattern of inter-imperialist um, logic. Russia is a player in the Middle East, has been ever since it intervened in the Syrian civil war. Um, Iran, uh, the backer of both Hamas and Hezbollah, recently joined the BRICS group of leading powers in the global south, which is headed by China. China itself is increasingly active in that region. So there's a very dangerous cocktail brewing in the, in the Middle East at the present time. And finally, there's the political dimension of the crisis, the, the rise of the far right uh, on a scale that clearly we haven't seen since the, since the 1930s. It looks as if the elections in Poland that were widely predicted to drag Poland even further to the right uh, won't have that effect, which is, which is of course, good. Um, but uh, nevertheless, uh, if we look at the United States, the dominant liberal capitalist power, the leader of the so-called free world, we see an extraordinary situation where Donald Trump, far from being disgraced by his role uh, on the 6th of January, um, far from being driven out of politics by the multitude of court cases being pursued against him, is the front runner for the liberal, uh, sorry, not, not the liberal, the Republican nomination uh, for the presidency in next year's uh, election. In some polls, is running ahead of Joe Biden. And where his supporters in the House of Representatives have succeeded in paralyzing the Congress, which will, if it continues, will have the effect of significantly reducing the US's ability to throw its weight around all over the world. Um, there's a degree of consensus in supporting Israel. There's not at all consensus when it comes to supporting Ukraine against, against Russia. The current most likely candidate to become Speaker of, Speaker of the House is an opponent of additional military aid to Ukraine, as is Trump him, himself. So we see the advance of the far right at the very citadel of modern advanced Western, Western capitalism. And of course, there are many cases elsewhere in Europe. Look at the way in Britain, look at the way in which the Tories have been increasingly pulled in a far right direction. Look at the way in which uh, Sunak uh, deniflects towards his his far right, particularly in the shape of Suella Braver, then. it's unclear whether it's out of a survival instinct or uh, out of genuine agreement, maybe a combination of, of the two. So, and this is an example of the way in which established centre-right parties are being drawn to, the, drawn to the right. Okay, I could go on and on about this. Now, the different dimensions of this, this crisis interact with each other. So it's becoming clear that the upsurge in inflation isn't simply a consequence of the way in which supply chains were disrupted during the pandemic, that they're also a result of um, longer term processes, in the particular the way in which climate change is affecting agricultural productivity, which means that the prediction that inflation will simply go away once the effects of the, the, the disrupted supply chains um, evaporate. And, you know, once again, there'll be a return to economic normal, if you, if you like, is very unlikely to be, to be true. Now, of course, 
a lot of you are probably listening to this and say, this sounds like Adam II's on the poly crisis. And it's true that the liberal economic historian, Adam Tooze, based in New York, but but from Britain, um, has written uh, fantastic analyses of the way in which um, the global political economy has been changing in the past few years, starting with his book on the financial crisis, then his book on, well, it was the first phase of the pandemic, then a stream of articles and um, posts, uh, online posts and so on and so forth. It's it's great, uh, his work, and I probably plagiarised it a fair amount. But I have two big disagreements with, with Adam. We had a nice discussion about this back in July this year. Um, and they are first of all to do with totality. And let me um, let me say a bit about that for for a few few minutes. What do I mean by totality? Um, it seems to me that one of the fundamental features of Marxism, and this is something that is thematized in particular by Georg Lukács and um, Jean-Paul Sartre, more recently, very, in a very interesting ways by Frederick Jameson, is, is the idea that what a Marxist critique of capitalism does is to totalize. In other words, to understand the capitalist system that we all live in and are dominated by as a totality whose different elements are integrated together, not in a kind of seamless uh, kind, of, kind of way, um, but rather in a way um, where, as Jameson puts it, the different elements, the different practices or institutions or whatever you want to call them, relationships that make up the totality are bound together as much by their differences as anything that they have in common. This internally differentiated and contradictory totality is what dominates us. And therefore, more concretely, that the different dimensions of crisis are dimensions of a single integrated totality. Um, they're dimensions of capitalism. They're dimensions that arise crucially from what Marx saw as the defining features of, of capitalism. First of all, the exploitation of wage labor by capital. And Marx, interestingly, in volume one of Capital, emphasizes the way in which the capitalist process of exploitation simultaneously degrades the worker and the natural environment on which the worker's laborer and indeed human kind more generally depend. Secondly, capitalism is a system that's driven by a process of competitive accumulation. In other words, rather than being, this is one reason why one shouldn't think of um, the different, the different, um, the different determination that make up the totality of capitalism as being somehow organic, organically harmonized to, together. It's a contradictory and un, unstable totality. Um, the, the, the basic units of, of the capitalist system are capital. In other words, sometimes firms, sometimes uh, states um, that compete with each other that compete with each other economically in the process imposing the logic of the capitalist system on each other and on society generally, that also in the form of states compete geopolitically, all also in that way imposing the logic of capital on, in this case, the global system, the international system, shaping and forging and reforging the, the international system. But this, these processes of competition drive towards different forms of crisis. 
whether they take the form of the economic cycle that is inherent in capitalism as a, as a system or towards geopolitical competition. And they facilitate and encourage the um, destruction of nature. So if we look at all the cops, these farcical co conferences of the parties that are supposed to be regulating the process of, um, well, now adapting to climate change, not preventing climate, climate change, to a very significant extent, they involve the, the major powers seeking to displace onto each other and also onto the, the societies of the global south the burden of beginning seriously to reduce, reduce emissions. And that kind of process of pass the parcel mean, helps to explain critically why emissions continue to rise year in and year out, despite the mountain of scientific reports warning against uh, allowing, allowing this to, 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 to happen. So I think a weakness of um, Tuzi's approach is that he tends to see the different elements of the, the, the poly crisis as relatively discrete independently constituted factors that interact with each other. Of course, there is interaction, but it's in the context of the way in which all these supposedly independent factors are integrated with and independent on, on each other as part of the same totality. The result, in any case, is um, what the... Um, Post-Keynesian economist James Galbraith called after the global financial crisis the end of normal. He wrote a great book with his title showing how all the presuppositions um, natural, economic, geopolitical and so on that the flourishing of US-style liberal capitalism had presupposed were disappearing. And therefore, the world was confronted with the need for a very radical restructuring. Um, well, I think that's basically basically right. But of course, a lot depends on what we mean by that restructuring. Now, this then leads me finally to the kind of political response, because the book is is a is a very political work. Um, and it's it, although the analysis it offers of the different dimension of this crisis, of this drive towards catastrophe, are sober and quite um, quite grim. Um, but I think that's that's necessary. The implication isn't that we should despair. One of the things that influenced me when I was thinking about catastrophe was, um, and exploring the theme, was the thought that Marxists have had to confront catastrophe before in what I now prefer to call Hobsbawm's first age of c catastrophe. Um, and for me, the most important reference points are provided particularly by Walter Benjamin and Theodor Adorno, two German Jewish Marxists who were forced to flee Germany in the face of the national socialist monstrosity. Uh, Benjamin eventually committing suicide in flight from the Nazi Blitzkrieg. Uh, Adorno succeeding in fleeing to the United States, but clearly scarred by the experience for, for life. And there, there are two very important ideas that I find in uh, Adorno, in Benjamin and Adorno. I mean, Benjamin's on the concept of history made a very strong impression on me when I read it first, um, oh, a long time ago, over 50 years ago. Thanks to a wonderful um, 
uh, television series, Ways of Seeing, presented by John Berger. They don't make them like that anymore. Um, because what he argues there is that the biggest weakness of the left in the face of the Nazis and the other fascist regimes and their allies and so on and so forth was to imagine that they were going with the stream, that history was moving in their favour. And he argues that to be able to address the way the world is, it's necessary to um, liberate Marxism from uh, any easy doctrine of progress, that's a qualification on my part that maybe someone would like to ask about, and instead to understand that the course of history has been one of catastrophe. Famous image of the uh, angel uh, uh, depicted by Paul Clay, uh, that Benjamin owned the picture, of this angel staring, being driven uh, driven uh, with its back, driven backwards into into the, what shall I say, the advance of history, but staring with horror at the catastrophe that history, history has, has been. It's necessary to understand history as a chain of catastrophes um, uh, redeemed by the struggle the struggles and determination and defiance of the oppressed and exploited. Uh, and in Adorno, Adorno was um, less politically robust than Benjamin was uh, in, in his eccentric way. Um, but he has this idea that capitalism is the permanent catastrophe. In other words, this is in his book, Negative Dialectics, his philosophical masterwork where he, you know, he's basically saying, don't think because the Nazis were eventually defeated and destroyed, but it's all, all okay because capitalism is the permanent catastrophe. It will bring new di new disasters. And that, that appreciation is, has proved proved correct, really, in, in my, my view. And this really takes me back to how Marxists something that I started with, but yeah, talking about Marxists rather than Extinction Rebellion or whoever, how Marxists have talked about catastrophe. Now, I think the, the most influential topos is provided by Rosa Luxemburg. When confronted with a genuine catastrophe, the disintegration of the world into the most terrible war, in 1914 and the disintegration also of the international socialist move, movement says that humankind is facing the choice between socialism or, or barbarism and i can't think how long how often i've repeated what luxembourg said and it's a fine fine saying but it begs the question of it, it, it again presents socialism as something that is going to prevent catastrophe, which of course wasn't true. The catastrophe was happening all around Luxembourg when she was when she was writing, um, and I think that's more our question today. Where where living in this complex of catastrophes, not just one catastrophe, but several with the prospect of even even worse should for example geopolitical competition get out of control and push us well not push us it would be it would depend on choices made by the leaders of the major major powers and push us towards a nuclear war which would finish humankind a lot quicker than climate change would um so we're in the midst of catastrophes. So the question for me is much more how amid catastrophes we can still uh, fight for a better world, fight for a world that can mitigate 
the catastrophes that are already upon us and can't simply be, um, you know, no, can no longer be avoided, but uh, also prevent worse catastrophes taking place and can also lay the basis for an eventual healing of the planet from all the destruction that humankind has inflicted on it. Um, now, um, so my theme is not catastrophe or revolution, but catastrophe and revolution. How the disasters we're experiencing can nevertheless stimulate revolt. We can see this um, at the at the present at the present time um, in the in movements in different parts of the world that are stimulated by the um, the effects of catastrophe. Um, it's I mean it's hard to be very cheerful about what's happening in the uh, northeast of Africa, for example, where there's a terrible war in uh, within Ethiopia and uh, a civil war that has developed in Sudan. Um, the liability of these areas to, to uh, for, for the Liberia, liability of these areas to war, I think, has the effect. Uh, has to do with the effects over dec decades of desertification, which at least partly is caused by climate change. So it's one manifestation of climate change, if you like. But it also has pr produced revolutionary movements. The civil war that's been it, um, imposed on, on Sudan is an attempt to snuff out the kind of revolutionary movement that has developed there. And we need to see whether that happens or not but we also i think the the effects of the inflation are very significant it, see, it seems to me there's something about inflation and the way in which it directly bites into people's ability to live and to feed their children which acts as a stimulus to, to resistance. A very oppressive regime in, in Sri Lanka was brought down in the spring of last year because of, uh, essentially because of the effects, the immiserating effects of the inflation. We see also uh, those effects uh, stimulating social struggles um, in uh, the so-called advanced capital, capitalist countries. We've seen a remarkable upsurge of strength in the two citadels of neoliberalism, the places where in the advanced capitalist world, neoliberalism started in the United States and Britain, which is interesting in, it, in itself. Um, and the driving force of these strikes is primarily a struggle to defend defend wages um, against the against the effects of inflation. I'm old enough to remember all the discussions about the significance of the wage and struggles around the wage that people theorised about in the 1970s, and then with mass unemployment and the growth of precarity, that seemed to you know the wage no longer seemed to be an interesting question, but the wage is. The struggle over the wage has come back with a vengeance, um, with varying degrees of success. And it's worth discussing, if we have done, why, certainly in Britain, the wages struggles have only had a limited effect in defending real wages, despite the scale of the strikes and so on. But uh, there's an important shift that has that has taken place, and it's a and these are wage struggles being wage by workforces that look very different from the kind of workforces um, 
that were involved in the struggles of the 1960s and 70s in Europe and North America. The face of the working class has changed, changed because of the effects of migration, changed because of the spread of different pro forms of precarity through through the working class. None of this is, is revolutionary. Indeed, that's precisely partly why the wages struggles haven't, haven't broken through. But nevertheless, there's a shift there that seems to be very important. And if I'm right that inflation isn't going to disappear quickly, then that can have quite a lasting, lasting significance. And it can have an effect politically. It's interesting to see a president of the United States going on a picket line in De Detroit, apparently the first time that a US president has ever gone on a picket line. I mean, that partly shows that, um, you know, it's an elect election time and Joe Biden is looking for support. But it's also, um, it's, it's also, you know, the fact that you, he thinks he can get votes by identifying with workers going on strike is quite is quite remarkable in itself. But of course, much more will be needed. Um, but I think um, I'd just like to finish by uh, referring to something that Benjamin says in one of the notes for his um, his text on the on the concept of history. He says. Marx said that revolutions are the locomotives of world history, but maybe they're more like the passengers on a train that's got out of control, pulling the emergency cord. In other words, revolution not as a kind of the steady progressive advance or the more and more organized working class or whatever, but as a desperate effort by the exploited and the oppressed to prevent us going over the cliff or capitalism taking us over the cliff. Okay, I rambled on enough. I think I'll stop there. Thanks very much. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Alex. That's terrific and uh, excellent timing. So we've got plenty of time uh, for discussion, about uh, 40 minutes. Do you have a preference about the questions, Alex? Uh, do you want one at a time, or are you happy to take two or three together? Or oh, you, I've lost you. I think you've got your yeah. Sorry, sorry. Um, no. uh, I'm happy to take two or three together. Uh, uh, okay. Well, let's just. I can see uh, CNM has got uh, her hand up. I, I assume as soon as somebody puts the hand up, I, I I will see that on my screen. But anyway, we're, we've only got one at the t for the time being, uh, Alex. So, uh, Sinem Bell. Yeah. Hi, Alex. Uh, it's a really uh, nice um, presentation, and we were all surrounded with the the fatal the fatalistic side of catastrophe all around us. <laughs> we we realized we recall everything. Yeah. Well, my question will be uh, about the, um, especially in the latest cases uh, uh, in the refugee crisis and uh, uh, in, in terms of Gaza and Israel, uh, you know, attacks or whatever, apartheid. Um, how would you uh, talk about, what would you say about the role of the left in, in this catastrophe? catastrophe because there is a floundering of the left in Europe and nowadays we are hearing about uh, for instance uh you know Labour Party in UK or uh Olaf Scholz in in Germany they overtly support Israel and uh I try to understand this I, I just Bernie Sanders and Jeremy Corbyn are two different guys that they are always supporting the civilians or and sometimes they call it the apartheid but for instance in for, in terms of this case uh that makes me questions uh, also in the refugee case that again the, there was a floundering of the left in europe and western societies uh, in terms or in 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 terms of refugee case um so what i see that they also are some sort of contributors of this catastrophe 
and I, I'm even I'm not quite sure if there is the if the leftist parties are in the distance. I'm I'm not quite sure they're presenting the distance exactly. So, how would you describe this? How would you what would you like to say about the role of left in this catastrophe? Thank you. Thank you. Disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> okay. Um, do you want me to come back? Um, well, I, I, or... obviously, Nem's asked a question. So, yes, why not? Yeah. Um... Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. I mean, it's a good phrase, the floundering of the left. And it's something that. <laughs> Sorry, maybe I should have stressed that, um, you know, if we look at the present situation, I think it's marked by something very, very important, which was that the radical left um, failed to provide an adequate response to the global financial crisis, which was the kind of, kind of break, the real break. Well, the situation broke in the decade of the 2000s, first of all, because of the disastrous um, uh, uh, invasions and occupations of Afghanistan and the Iraq, which weakened the US in particular, and, all, and to some extent humiliated it, which was then reinforced by the global financial crisis uh, with profound long-term impacts for the populations of both, the, uh, both North America and Western, Western Europe. But it was the left, and I mean particularly the radical left. I mean, uh, you, we can discuss the Labour Party, but with um, the what effective the expulsion of Corbyn, yeah. Labour has nothing to do with the radical left any anymore. The whole point of Keir Starmer is to is to almost literally purge Labour of the radical left, or to intimidate it so much that it doesn't doesn't speak. But on the whole, the radical left, and I include myself among them, so I should really say we failed to provide a strong enough response to the to the global financial crisis. That so why? Liberal, why? Why? How would you how would you give an answer for this? Why? As a leftist person, what do you think? All, all sorts of reasons. All sorts of reasons. Um, in some cases, the left was just too weak and marginal. Um, the way in which the British political system makes it quite easy to mar marginalise the radical left. That's why there was such indignation when, you know, Corbyn dared to to be a elected leader leader of the Labour Party. But it's also um, to to do with the kind of strategy that key sections of the radical left pursued. I mean, the, the clearest case of this is Syriza in Greece, where a decade ago, the international left were completely infatuated with Alexis Tsipras and, and, and Syriza. And then in office, you know, they buckled. They, you know, all this radical rhetoric, and then they're confronted with you know, putting it crudely, the capitalist class doing what they do, which is trying to crush challenges, and they buckle. And that, you know, if we look at Greece today, the last election, <laughs> very right-wing Conservative Party, New De Democracy, won hev heavily. So, so you can say that the left missed the bus of the global financial crisis. And I think one, one of the things I take from Gramsci, who went through a much more extreme version of this experience, is that if you miss a revolutionary opportunity, it's, <laughs> it's not like, oh, just things carry on as normal. You know, it's a pity we missed the opportunity, but it'll be, business as usual, we can carry on with our lives. 
It isn't like that at all. If you miss a revolutionary opportunity, the situation deteriorates, partly because the objective problems that provided the revolutionary opportunity are still there <coughs> and help to cause the kind of deterioration that we've seen uh, since 2007-9, but also because revolutionary threats scare the dominant classes. So they look towards more extreme solutions. Now, don't get me wrong, they're split. You know, there's a polarization between the kind of neoliberal, the shrinking neoliberal mainstream and the far right. But the far right, you know, has quite serious support these days. If we look, say, at Giorgia Meloni in, in Italy, she's not, you know, she's taken quite seriously <coughs> and positive by the Italian business establishment. I see other people have raised their hand, so maybe that's the mm. beginning of a response to your okay. question, although Thank there's, of course, a lot more to discuss. Could yeah. you put your hand down, Sinem, then I can... Uh, I yep, can, yep, I, yep. Right, I've got a couple... Thank you, Tony. Uh, I've got a couple of questions, but there's one or two things in the chat. Uh, so I, uh, Oliver's pointed out that uh, everybody's muted, so if you want to ask a question, you need to raise your sort of electronic Zoom hand so that we know, that, you, and then we'll unmute you. And the, so that, that's... Thank you for that. Uh, Oliver. Kim White uh, makes an interesting observation about Rosa Luxemburg's comment about socialism and barbarism. The, the, uh, the choice today is not between socialism and barbarism, but between eco-socialism and planetary annihilation. So thank you very much for that, uh, Kim. Right. OK, so uh, Andy Higginbottom uh, has a question and so does Andreas Albila. So uh, Andy first uh, and then Andreas and perhaps, well, I both together, in fact, and we'll give... Um, uh, Alex, the opportunity yeah. to, to answer them both. So, uh, thank you, Alex. I mean, I've read your book, and it is it is impressive that you've got it out and you're giving a direct commentary on what is truly is a sort of poly multiple crisis. But I have got a critical note to to raise, which is I think um, it's a bit weak when it comes to the specifics of the role of British imperialism in the midst of this crisis, and that is quite important since those of us who are socialists in Britain need to address yeah. the role of our own ruling class and it is particularly so when you think about the whole question of climate change because there's so many big mining corporations and oil corporations financed from London based in London that actually we have a massive responsibility to uh, uh, tackle our own fossil fuel multinationals and on this the left the Marxist left has been incredibly weak it is XR and other eco, if you like, green social movements, which have raised this issue. So I think there's an awful lot of humble pie to be eaten. But uh, uh, Marxism has got something to contribute, which is the theory of imperialism. I mean, these are imperialist corporations uh, which are taking massive profits from the rest of the world. I mean, these big corporations are responsible for seven times more carbon emissions than the whole of the UK population put together. So we, we live in a particularly imperialist country. So if we're looking at the totality, we also have to look at how we fit into that totality. OK, uh, so do you want to respond immediately or should I let Andreas ask? No, his... Let's hear from Andreas as okay. well and then yeah. I'll respond to both. OK, Andreas? Yeah, thanks a lot, Alex, for that excellent tour de force uh, presentation as Oliver mentioned at the start we are currently reading your book yeah and our Marxism reading group at, at Nottingham and uh, we are just into it but it was very good to hear you outline some of the other arguments to follow I want to follow up on what Sinem said so you said oh, they, they left buckled when you looked at Greece but I think perhaps one needs to also appreciate the kind of structuring pressures on the Greek left and also perhaps the failure of the European left to provide any kind of meaningful support in that particular moment. You know, we didn't have large demonstrations in other European capitals during the Greek crisis in 2015. But I also think if you look, and that follows us on from Sinem's question, if you look at the current challenges and the catastrophes, I think what is, is quite revealing also is that actually the radical left seems to be unable to find a clear common position 
in in response to these. Yeah, so their analysis, even from different Marxist backgrounds, go in all kinds of different directions. And I think it it starts with the pandemic, where the vaccine anti-vaxxer kind of issues cut across to some extent. It cuts across even more strongly when it comes to the assessment of the Ukraine-Russia war and how that should be understood. Yeah, there's bitter infighting amongst the radical left. And I would imagine even in relation to the current catastrophe with the war in Palestine, uh, again, the, the left actually struggles to find a common position. And how can we understand that? Yeah, that at these moments of crisis, perhaps similar to 1914, if, if one goes back to that, where the left also suddenly in view of that war did not find a common position. We are again back to a situation where the left struggles even to find this kind of common starting point of how to address and position itself on those crises. Okay, thank you, Andreas. So, Alex. Okay, well, thanks for, for, for those questions. Firstly, Andy, yeah, it's a fair point. I don't say much about British imperialism specifically in the, in the book. Um, I, I think there were two reasons, and, uh, and I agree, it's a very important subject, particularly for socialists in Britain. I mean, I do talk a lot about imperialism more generally, but I don't focus on British imperialism. I think there were two reasons. First of all, I was trying to write a book that was, to some extent, about the generality of the crisis. And um, one in which the US, if you look at the book, the US plays a much more important role in the story than, than Britain does, which, of course, you know, the US is objectively a lot more important by, um, important than Britain. Secondly, um, you know, getting a kind of fixing what British imperialism is about is quite a complicated question at the present time because British imperialism was hugely disorganised by Brexit because Brexit destroyed what had been really the perfect positioning for British imperialism which is the US's closest and most loyal ally in its system of alliances in Europe, and simultaneously taking advantage, the, the city and so on, taking advantage of access to the single market, which after all was partly Margaret Thatcher's idea. So, you know, and if I'd looked at British imperialism, I, I think I would have had to go into those things. And it just didn't, you know, there was enough to write about as it is. And I have written a lot about British imperialism and its quandaries, but mainly in articles and editorials and things like that. Secondly, um, on Andreas's question, I mean, I think it's true. Well, it's not that there wasn't solidarity for the Greek player. But on the whole, it took the form of cheerleading. I think, and that wasn't particular, particularly helpful. I think it's um, also true, and I think we, you know, we're going to see it more and more, the, the failure of Die Linke, in other words, of the radical left party that emerged in Germany in the 20, 2000s to become a real serious alternative. Um, I think was very damaging for the left in Europe generally. And uh, the, the weakness of Die Linke first emerged in its response to the, the global financial crisis, where it didn't really kind of break from the kind of conventional economic thinking in Germany. And I think that that, that weakened, us, weakened us generally. Secondly, I agree. I mean, the left is the divisions in the left are appalling and very depressing. I, I mean, of course, you know, I talked about Brexit. Brexit is an issue that has div divided the British left in, the, you know, in quite, quite extreme terms. And then, then we've had these, these other, other, other dis disagreements um, over Ukraine. I think probably. 
the issue of Gaza will not be so divisive, um, partly because um, what Israel is starting to do is just so undeniably horrible that that will produce a, a reaction of opposition and so on. I mean, the demonstrations right across Britain at the weekend in solidarity with Palestine were very impressive and, and heartening. So I don't think the picture is uniformly, uniformly depressing, but I think that the, the, the left has damaged it itself a lot. And it's difficult because, you know, it's quite important whether or not, say, the war in Ukraine is in part a proxy war waged by the US against against Russia. That's an important question, both factually and politically, but it divides people people hugely. Uh, I don't know, you know, I don't know what to do about that, except to kind of argue the question through and hope over time that some degree of agreement on what I think is the right position emerges. But maybe I'm too optimistic. Anyway, I'll stop there. Thank you very much, uh, Andreas and Andy. Uh, so, uh, Mike Goldfield has a question. Uh, over to you, Mike. I think you're muted. Are, are you... So, um, I read your book, Alex. I thought the, as with lots of your other work, the first four chapters in particular were masterful in synthesizing sharply a huge amount of material about what's going on in the present. Um, it seems to me, and this follows up with what you've been talking about, that a key difference from the 1930s is that the left groups are so tiny compared to socialist and social democratic and communist parties all over the world, even in the United States where the parties were considered small. And it seems to the things that we point to, Black Lives Matter, the climate activism you mentioned in the book, Occupy, these have all been brilliant mass movements that were ephemeral and disappeared almost without a, tra um, a trace. In the United States, um, people thought that the democratic socialists there might be conflict. They've moved so far to the right that most people, leftists who thought they could work with it have left. Um, I'm less um, enthusiastic, although hopeful that something will change about the degree of struggle, particularly in the, U in the US and Britain, but particularly in the US. Um, but the impact of the left is uneven. Left groups may mostly cheerleaded the um, struggle with United Parcel with the Teamsters, um, which there's debate about whether it was a sellout or whether they gained anything. The stuff going on in auto where the union is very weak, which is why they're doing these small strikes. It's unclear what the resolution um will be so and within that context one wonders what leftists far left of which i consider myself one should be doing um things are at least as fragmented in the u.s as any place else in terms of small little left groups so um it's not clear where we can go from here, um, barring dramatic events, which are unpredicted, which almost all, are always unpredicted. So um, what should left groups be doing in anticipation of the next upsurge um, at this time? OK, thank you very much. Uh, Oliver has his hand up, so should we ask Oliver also, and then you can respond to them both? Yeah. 
Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for that, Alex. Really en enjoyed the talk. and I'm enjoying reading your book as well as part of the Marxism reading group. I'm just, uh, I really mind a conceptual question. You seem to separate, you know, conceptually into clear dynam dimensions. You talk about political crisis, economic crisis, geopolitical crisis. And I'm just wondering to what extent uh, this is sustainable uh, conceptually, theoretically, uh, and whether we can understand these various dimensions really internally related to class struggle uh, and, and not really just inter you know, interacting out there, but really, you know, very much rooted as a kind of totality. Okay, thank you. So, Alex. Okay, thanks. Those who are having two really difficult questions. <laughs> I'll start with Oliver's first. Um, I think, you know, as I made it clear, I'm strongly committed to totalization, but I think there is, I mean, I think totalization, if everything were integrated in a simple way, totalization wouldn't be a very intellectually interesting activity. What makes it sort of challenging and demanding is that there is a degree of difference between I like the Hegelian word determination, the different different determination. So I think, um, you know, let's just take economics, uh, geopolitics and, and politics, you know, in the supposedly domestic sense. I think they do have an important sense of different logic. I mean, the logic of capital is driven by you know, Marx, Marx's famous circuit, MCM Prime, um, and the different forms in which that can be, or the different particular ways in which, you know, the profits, the prime, the, the, the bit that is additional in the cycle, in the MCM Prime cycle, can be gained through productive investment or through finance or real estate, etc., etc., etc. That's a distinctive logic which is driven by, you know, in particular, the the drive and mobility of capital in its search for profit. If we're talking about geopolitics, we're talking about interstate relationships, which have a distinctive character which is different because because of the way in which states. Um, you know, partly for reason, the kind of reasons that um, that realists go on about the, the coercive character of states, their ability to maintain order and extract resources from their their societies, and um, all the 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 complexities in in involved in managing their relationships at a regional and, and global level, and. When it comes to politics, the politics is a struggle over the over the state, and you know that it, in turn, has distinctive structures and constraints. I, I, I won't elaborate further. So I think there are we're talking about real differences, but real differences that if you do enough enough work, and I suppose I mean it's kind when. Mike pay, praised the opening chapters of my book. That's what I was trying to do, to do at least the minimum amount of work in the areas that I particularly focused on. One can see the different logics intermeshing and arising from the, the unifying structures and dynamics of capitalism itself. Anyway, that's, that's what I aspire to, even I, I fail at it. Mike, what is to be done? <laughs> well, I think there are two things. There are two things. And f first of all, I should say, Mike is a very um, distinguished historian of labor in the United States and particularly how it struggled with with ra racism and the oppression of in pat particular African-Americans. So when he, you know, says that you shouldn't get too excited about 
current wage wage struggles. I mean, one has to take that very seriously. Nevertheless, I do think that there's a there's a, there's a shift. It's it's marked in 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 Britain, although it doesn't go far enough. And in, in the U.S., you know, when I think it was General Motors says, okay, uh, you know, we'll allow union can can conditions in the plants producing electric vehicles, which is a section of the industry that has a future, that, you know, that seems to be something quite quite significant. I know it's not finalised and so on, but, you know, that feels like a degree of workers' power has been exercised. But maybe I'm too optimistic. And, you know. uh, but in terms of what we do, I think there are two things. Well, three things. First of all, we have to endure. I agree the left is smaller and weaker than, well, than it was 20 years ago, let alone what, what it was like in the, uh, in the interwar period. Um, but it's important for left-wing organization and politics to endure, to, to continue, to offer a, a model of political activity that can draw in new, new generations if, if socialist practice is sufficiently open and dynamic and creative. First thing is endure. Secondly is understand, to try and use the intellectual tools that the Marxist tradition in particular has created over the last 150 years or whatever, to make sense of what's happening. That's very important because it's, you know, everything is such a terrifying mess that it's getting worse. But a, a clear Marxist analysis can help to untangle at least some of that mess. Thirdly, to be where the resistance is. And going back to the, the first question, I mean, uh, you know, I think in, in certainly in Europe, building anti-racist movements that, uh, as a matter of principle, express solidarity with refugees and their right to move, their right to cross, cross borders, and that defends them against the increasing repression is, defended, is, is descending upon them, is, ex is extremely important. And it's something that I think can, can, that can and is um, capturing people's imagination. I mean, I'm, it's not the same issue, although in a way it is, um, but the, the demonstrations about Palestine at the weekend in Britain were remarkable, you know, as an, among other things, an expression of multiracial Britain, not the whole of the society, I don't have illusions about that, but a big chunk of multiracial multi uh, Britain standing up against racism and colonialism and in solidarity with the oppressed. I think it's really important to be part of these movements where they develop. Okay, they can be ephemeral, but it's it's interesting that that in Britain every time there's an attack on Gaza or the West Bank, you get these kinds of protests. That I was thinking the other day about the, you know, I was thinking, what have my, you know, it's got a bit personal, you know, what has the radical left of my generation achieved, particularly over the last 20, 20 years or so? And it's helped, in as much as in Britain at least, we've helped to create a culture of solidarity with Palestine on a principled anti racist and anti colonial this basis. We've helped to do that. Lots of other people have been in, involved, particularly from Muslim organizations and so on and so forth. That's quite an important achievement. Sorry, that was a bit of a wrap. Sorry, I muted myself. Uh, thank you very much, Alex. Uh, do we have any more questions? I don't think there's anything. 
in the chat uh, either. Well, okay. If we don't, then I think perhaps we'll uh, let Alex off the hook. Uh, thank you very much indeed for an, an excellent uh, talk, Alex, and, and, and I hope everybody enjoyed it and found the discussion uh, helpful uh, as well. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I enjoyed it very much myself. All the okay. best. <laughs> right. So I'm sure people will be well. thanking you in the chat as well. Uh, okay. Okay, right. I, so I'll sign off then. Before we go, Tony, oh, yeah. can okay, I yeah. just uh, yeah. remind colleagues the Center for Study of Social and Global Justice, of course, has a weekly seminar slot, and we will carry on next week with a presentation by a younger colleague who has been working on the comments uh, in Naples. And if you want, to see our program. And if you want to register for one of the other talk, please go to our website. Oliver has put that in the chat here, cssgj.org. And there you can find all the titles of upcoming seminars, the membership option, which Tony included, and ho hopefully see one or the other of you again at one of our next meetings. Thank you, Tony. Sorry for well, the interruption. That's over perfect. to you. That's okay. I, well, oh, well, so uh, I'll just sign off then and thank everybody for attending as well as Alex. Thank you very much. See you all again. Thanks, okay. Alex. Thanks Bye. very much. Bye then.